uh, I've been preaching about 25 years. And so the first 10 or 15 years of my ministry, I, I, I did a, quite a bit of teaching on Bible prophecy. And so this week I was talking to several different pastors, literally all across the nation. And they were just sharing with me how that they were transitioning their messages for this coming Sunday to deal with some of those subjects. And that's something I had felt as well. It's some things that had come out of our staff meetings and staff prayer time. Some of them had communicated with me. They felt like it'd be really beneficial to people. So on big Wednesday, I talked a little bit about it, but even coming into Sunday, I still just really felt like, Hey, let's revisit some things from, from Bible prophecy. And so, um, we're going to, we're going to do it today. We're going to talk about some things with Israel. We're going to talk about some things with the Middle East. We're going to talk about how to understand some things in the Bible chronologically when it comes to the end times. And uh, I do need to give credit to one individual in, in particular. Uh, I have an acquaintance that's just absolutely brilliant in, in biblical, the subject of biblical prophecy. He recently did a teaching and, um, and he, he didn't necessarily share things I had never heard before or something new to me, but rather I just loved the way that he put it in order. And so today I'm actually going to steal the order that he put it in together for as I walk us through this. All right. So let's start here. Revelate or Luke chapter 12, verse number four says, and Jesus said, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that have no more that they can do, but I will show you whom you should fear, fear him who after he has killed the body has the power to cast into hell. Yes. I say to you, fear him. And so Jesus here is clearly painting a picture of the throne of heaven and how that God is ultimately in charge of our eternal destination. And so he's saying to us, don't ever worry about the spirit of fear or fearing the world. Instead, fear the Lord. And by that, what he means is have reverential awe for God. Hold God in high reverence. Hold God in high esteem. And understand he holds your eternity in his hands. So speaking of that, we can look at the book of Revelation and we see this in chapter 14, verse 6. It says, And then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, to every tribe, to every tongue, to every people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Aren't you thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ? That we have the good news that tells us that we're going to be able to be ready for eternity. But along the way, one of the things we have to make sure that we do is that we are not giving glory to everything else in this world rather than ultimately giving glory to God because we fear him. We have reverential awe for him. And again, I just want to say, as we've unpacked this series, which we've entitled Awestruck, we're, we're not talking about being scared of God to the point we run away from him. Instead, when we're talking about the fear of the Lord, we're saying our greatest fear in life is that we would not have God's presence, that we would be terrified by being cast out of his presence. That's what we long for above all else. So let's talk about it today, awestruck. Father, help me teach, help me preach, move us forward in your will for our life. May there be an anointing that is rich and real in this room. May our hearts be tilled and fertile soil for the seed of the word. God, let me yield your sword with skillfulness. Show me where to pierce, show me where to heal in Jesus' name. And this church said, amen. amen. This week I had to be in Nashville for some meetings and uh, I actually wound up on some roads that I had never been on before. Uh, even though I'm quite familiar with that town, I was unfamiliar with these particular uh, back roads, and my GPS had kind of rerouted me around a little bit. And I keep my phone on a magnetic holder that's on the air conditioner vent. And so, you know, with her call, <clears throat> if that had been timed differently, you'll understand in just a moment. <laughs> uh, and so I, I, you know, you get a phone call, it's easy access, but also sometimes you can get a text message and maybe you're not going to reply to it, but you're just going to, you know, see what it says. I had a text message come through and it seemed like it was concerning, something that was going to require my focus. And I was trying to figure out, does that say what I think it says? And while this is, while I'm trying to read this text message, I actually recognize that there's a railroad track in front of me and I recognize that there's some lights blinking but there's no barrier down. So I just proceed across the railroad tracks. As I did so, the engineer of the oncoming train expressed his displeasure quite significantly. Um, I, 
I was rattled. I was shaking. In fact, I actually had to pull the vehicle over for a few minutes and just try to make sense of what had just happened because as I was trying to unpack it, I was like, what in the world? I, I literally just pulled out right in front of a train. Like, I've been driving since I was 16 years old. How did I pull out in front of a train? And then I realized I didn't see it. I know you were expecting a greater revelation. But the reason I didn't see it is because I was distracted. I didn't see it because I was focused on something different. And also, I expected it to look different than it looked. I would have thought there would have just been a barrier down, blocking the road completely. It didn't happen the way that I thought it was going to happen. And as I was reflecting upon how this, this train nearly hit me, I couldn't help but be reminded of, of Bob Dylan. And many years ago, he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And during that particular season of his life, he got really interested in Bible prophecy and he started studying it. And he discovered that there had always been, as he termed it, a slow train coming. But he had never seen it. He had never recognized it because he was basically hindered by other things focused on other things and maybe even thinking it would look a different way. And so he actually wrote some songs trying to encourage people to be aware that there is a slow train coming. And when you think about the fact that Jesus Christ has made the statement, behold, I come quickly. And yet that was 2000 years ago. Obviously God's time does not move at the same pace as we would process time. One of the reasons for that is because God has says that to him, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. But there is something coming down the rails of eternity and you and I have to be aware of it and we need to be really cautious about being overly hindered, overly distracted, totally focused on something else to the point that we miss what is coming down the rails of eternity. So we want to have wisdom about the end times. We want to have knowledge about the end times. And what we've learned in this series is that there is no such thing, according to Scripture, as wisdom and knowledge unless you first possess the fear of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, collectively say this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom and all knowledge. So our working definition of the fear of the Lord is that we need to have reverential awe for God. What that means is that we hold him in high esteem, that we highly value him, that we are putting him first, that we're not just going to be casual in our relationship with God, but that we are literally going to revere God. Now, as I've continued to study the fear of the Lord, uh, even in preparation for today's message, I've found even more verses that I think are worth sharing with you. The fear of the Lord is mentioned over 200 times in Scripture. Here's a couple more. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 23. The fear of the Lord leads to life. So in other words, if you will express reverential awe for God, you'll find life. And what it says is that he who, abide, or he who has this will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited by evil. Throughout the course of this series, we've learned that the fear of the Lord will put you on the right path. The fear of the Lord will see to it that even your prayers are answered at a greater level and a greater capacity. That the, the fear of the Lord has all of these benefits scripturally, including the fact that you are going to be satisfied. And one of the reasons you'll be satisfied is because you won't be visited with evil. Why? Proverbs 16, 6 says, because by fearing the Lord, people avoid evil. Maybe that's because in Proverbs 8, 13, it says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So why is it good to be separated from evil? Because according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, we will stand before Christ to be judged and we will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or the evil that we have done in this earthly body. Now, when it comes to the evil that might slip into our lives and the sinful mistakes that we might make, I think this verse is also important. 1 Timothy chapter 5. 
It says, remember that the sins of some people are obvious, leading them to certain judgment. But there are others whose sins will not be revealed until later. In the same way, the good deeds of some people are obvious and the good deeds done in secret will someday come to light. So here's what we're learning. If we're going to avoid evil, we got to make sure that we have reverential awe for God. One of the benefits of avoiding that evil is that we're going to live a life that has a greater level of satisfaction because we're hating evil. But there's some people that are better at hiding their sin than others. And so even if you're one of those people that feel like, well, nobody knows about my sin and I've been able to keep my skeletons in the closet and it hasn't really come out yet, I want you to understand that one of the things this scripture is saying is that whether you're good at hiding it or not, when you stand before the throne of judgment, it's all going to be brought to light. It will either be revealed now or it will be revealed later. And Hebrews 10 breaks it down this way. Understand, the Lord will judge his people. So it really doesn't matter what Beulah and Freddie think about you and all the things they've said about you and all the ways you felt judged at the family reunion. At the end of the day, it is the Lord that's in charge of judging people. And now notice what it says. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So when you think about the moment where your eternity is being reviewed in the hands of a living God, that should be something that you are never casual about considering. It's something you should look towards with fear and trembling, but also with faith as you hold it in reverential awe. This becomes increasingly important because of something that Paul prophesies is going to happen in the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, there's a time coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever they want to hear. They will reject the truth and they will chase after myths, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't even be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Instead, work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the, carry out the ministry that God has given you. Right there is the reason that Three Trees Church exists, because everyone needs Jesus and everyone needs the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have both a collective and an individual responsibility to carry that gospel to as many people as we possibly can because as time increases, people are going to be deceived and they're going to be heaping unto themselves people that just tell them what they want to hear and they need to know the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that can lead them to salvation as old things pass away and everything becomes new. Now, some of the things I've shared with you this morning, obviously from different writers and scriptures, we've read several now verses from Paul, but I want to share with you something that Jesus himself said. And in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, and they will even claim to be Christ. And they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Then there will be famines, there will be pestilences, there will be earthquakes in various places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. The Greek word there means birth pains. So what Jesus is saying is that this whole thing with deception is only going to get worse and worse. And one of the ways that Jesus wants to try to keep people awake to the need to reverence him is by allowing the earth to have birth pains. And what he means by that is that in the same way that a pregnant woman, when she gets close to her due date, will go into contractions and she will go into labor, Jesus is saying that the earth is going to have contractions. It's, it's going to go through labor pains as it makes way for the ultimate return of the Son of God. You think about those birth pains, he says sometimes the birth pain will be a war. Other times the birth pain will be a rumor of a war. Other times it'll be a pestilence or a pandemic or a massive earthquake. It'll be birth pains. And so as we're trying to, to observe these birth pains that are happening in the earth, I think there's some things we need to have a fundamental understanding of when it comes to Bible prophecy. So I want to share three things with you foundationally. Number one, Biblical end-time prophecy revolves around Israel. 
Biblical end time prophecy revolves around Israel. Second, the end times in Israel revolve around Jerusalem. Third, God will make Jerusalem the capital city of the entire world. So today we, we're going to talk about Israel. We'll learn some things about Jerusalem. We may even talk some about God's ultimate plans for Jerusalem being the capital of the world. But know this, more than you can learn anything about biblical prophecy, there is something that, that supersedes all knowledge you can gain. The number one thing you need to know as you get ready for the end of time or your moment before God's throne is that you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's the number one thing you can learn. And even the birth pains that happen in the earth are God's way of trying to wake you up to the knowledge that you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And one of the ways that can happen is number one, you need to recognize that you have broken God's law. God's commands can be simplified to two things above all else. Number one, love God more than everybody in anything. And every single one of us have failed at that at some point. Number two, love people more than yourself. And every single one of us have failed at that at some point. And so when we break that law, the Bible says sin is lawlessness. So when we fail to honor God's commands, we've broken his law, that is sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. So the only way to be set free from the consequences of sin is we need some kind of an intervention. And that is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes would not perish but have everlasting life. So what you and I have to do is after we recognize that we've broken God's law, we have to repent for having done so. And as a part of that repentance, we invite Jesus to forgive us of our sin, to become our Savior, and we confess and commit our life to him as Lord. So what we're doing is we're ultimately receiving Jesus into our life. That's the number one thing you're going to learn today. But one week ago, the statement filled the airwaves and the news headlines. Israel is at war. And that is no small thing. Because that statement may have not awakened Christians or even the general public as it could have or it should have, but you can guarantee it awakened the national and the international leaders of the world. Especially when Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, stepped out and he made what I believe is an absolutely jarring statement. He said, the war will take time and it will be extremely difficult. The war will take time and it will be extremely difficult. What the leader of Israel is saying is that the Israeli government understands that this is not going to be something that just happens quickly and then is over with. It's not just going to be a blip on the radar of world news. What he is saying is that this is going to be a long haul and that Israel is okay with this thing extending into the long term. And when you hear that, you might say, well, I don't even care, man. That don't really apply to me. I don't even understand the geography of the Middle, Middle East. And it's just, I'm, and it's not something I'm concerned about. Well, if you are a Bible-believing Christian, you need to understand that you are commanded by Scripture to pray for Israel. The Bible says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. One of the few times that we find Jesus weeping in Scripture is when he is in a mountain overlooking Jerusalem and he's most likely looking through the telescope of prophecy and seeing all of the pain that it will go through before the blessing arises and he is praying in tears for Jerusalem. So when we think about trying to understand these things, I was talking to some pastor friends. and We, we, we kind of came to the conclusion that there really are probably five terms that all Christians need to know when it comes to understanding modern Israel in Bible prophecy. Number one, Hamas. You've probably heard that a lot lately. Hamas is the political party that has taken credit for invading Israel and bringing harm over the last week or so. They are a part of the Palestinians. 
a political movement, a part of the Palestinians. They reside primarily in the Gaza Strip. Second is Fatah. Fatah is formerly known as the Palestinian National Liberation Movement. They are a political party. They are a counterpart to Hamas, but Hamas and Fatah don't really get along that well. For that reason, Hamas is primarily based out of the Gaza Strip. Fatah seems to have more of a base in the West Bank. I'll show you those on a map in just a moment. Third term you need to know is Palestine. When, and they'll go ahead and just pull this up, um, the map. So everything that, that you see in both this tan color and this green uh, is recognized as Israel. As of 1948, Israel became a state. In 1967, there was a six-day war. Israel took authority over the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. The issue presently is, is that they're inside the West Bank and inside the Gaza Strip is primarily Arabs who hold to an Islamic faith and they believe that this entire section of land should be called Palestine. That's what it was called for a period of time up until 1948. And then when Israel was recognized, that, that, that Palestinian term was taken away. So in Gaza is where the Hamas are currently residing but e even though maybe they are at somewhat odds with Fatah, they believe that all of this should be Palestine. And so what you have is this entire section of land is actually smaller than the state of New Jersey. And yet you've got millions of people that are pressed into this land, part of them being Israeli Jews, part of them being Arabic Muslims, and all of them believe that the boundary lines are wrong. Has anybody ever lived in a neighborhood where two neighbors couldn't get along over a boundary line? Now imagine that multiplied by millions. And what you have is a powder keg that is sitting there waiting to explode. So even the, the city of Jerusalem presently is split in half where the eastern part of Jerusalem is in the West Bank and the other part of Jerusalem is on the western side. And so when you're, when you're looking at Israel and you're hearing terms like Hamas and Fatah and Palestine and West Bank and Gaza Strip, those are terms you're probably going to hear a lot if this war does, in does in indeed continue to remain extended. And so the question then becomes with Hamas taking the forefront right now of like, what are they fighting for? They're fighting for land. They're fighting for religious beliefs. They believe that Israel has stolen their land from them, that the Jews have taken what their God, Allah, would want them to have. So now they use the term jihad, that they're in a war. They believe it to be a holy war. They believe that they are authorized by the Koran to kill anything that stands in their way. Anyone that disagrees with their religion is viewed as an infidel. And so now they're making statements like all the Jews should be wiped off the face of the planet. They're adding intense verbiage to that, that Christians should also be wiped off the face of the planet. And there was a time where it was just barking dogs. Because when you would see them on the news, even in my lifetime, they just they were throwing rocks or they had little handguns. Today, when you see them, they're carrying rocket launchers, they're carrying advanced military technology, and, and things seem to be intensifying at a substantial rate. They say that one of the reasons that is transpiring is because Iran, who also agrees that Palestine should take the place of Israel and would be of an Arabic Islamic fundamentalist viewpoint, is probably funneling money into the Hamas. That means any time that money is given to Iran, whether you knowingly or unknowingly are doing it, you may be aligning with the destruction of Israel, and that's a problem because the Bible says if you bless Israel, you will be blessed, and if you curse Israel, you will be cursed. And so there's a great importance to align with God's will. And so when you think about, well, wait a second, does this new war in Israel relate to Bible prophecy? Well, it's certainly a birth pain. Now, the level of that birth pain Right now, only God knows. In fact, anytime something starts to happen in Israel, there's immediate panic among people, especially people who really like Bible prophecy. It turns into clickbait on social media. Conversations erupt. And so here's what I would say to you. Don't panic, but live ready. Could you just help me preach for a minute? Come on, look at somebody and tell them, don't panic, 
but live ready. Because Jesus said there are going to be wars and there are going to be rumors of wars. There's going to be nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. But that doesn't mean the immediate coming of the Lord. It just means that there are birth pains. But if you've ever been with a woman who was pregnant and she got closer to her due date, what happened? The contractions increased. The labor became more violent. And the same thing is going to happen in the earth. The more violent this becomes, the more intense it happens, the more earthquakes you see, the more pandemics you experience, the more pestilences transpire and the shorter the time period between them, the closer you are to the coming of the Lord. Birth pains. But the reality of conflict in the Middle East is that anytime Israel has existed, there has been conflict. The devil hates Israel because they are God's chosen people. You read the Old Testament, there's the Amalekites, there's the Amorites, there's the Edomites, there's the Midianites, there's the Philistines, there's the Babylonian Empire, there's the Persian Empire, there's the Roman Empire. Israel's always been in a fight. Somebody always trying to take her land. Why? Because the devil hates Israel. Why? Because like it or not, agree with them or not agree with them, they are God's chosen people and that settles it. And for the record, America is not God's chosen people. In fact, when you look into the, the, the Bible prophecy, it's very difficult to even find America. Type, shadow, or by name. Some scholars would say that when you see a teacher try to hermeneutically force America into, into Bible prophecy, you, you probably should proceed with great caution because it, it just doesn't fit well. So how is it that the strongest nation on the face of the planet seems to be this close to the end of time and then doesn't show up in Bible prophecy in a clear and direct way? Well, a lot of people believe the reason for that is because there's going to be a rapture of the church. Now, there's a term called rapture and there's a term called second coming. And second coming is the moment where Jesus comes once and for all, battle of Armageddon, settles it all, it's done. But some believe that there's a separate event called the rapture. And that the rapture perhaps would be a moment that would happen before or in the middle of a seven-year tribulation period when all hell's breaking loose on earth. And in that moment, what would happen is all followers of Jesus, all the church people would be pulled out instantaneously. Now, now if that is the case, it would make sense that America, a country of 300 million people that professes 90 million Christians would instantly cease to exist in the way we know it if nearly 100 million people were taken out of this nation. Every system you know would cease to function because the Christians would be removed. Maybe, maybe that's why it's not mentioned. Only God knows. Some of it may become clearer as time progresses. And I've often said it this way, I don't know if it's pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. All I know is this. First load, I am out of here. Maybe we should have a rapture drill. So you heard me mention the tribulation. And so when you read the book of Revelation, it's all about the tribulation. And the tribulation is a seven-year period of time. It's going to start off not too bad. Three and a half years in, it's going to get really bad. And in that last three and a half years, Horrific horrific things happening on the earth. So here's pretty much the gist of it. Throughout that seven years, there is going to be a leader that's going to arise. He's going to be a world leader. He's going to be possessed. Holy ghost. <laughs> he's going to be possessed by Satan. And he's going to be able to do things that really no human leader has ever been able to do before. And it's going to be because he's going to have the blessing of Satan upon his life. In fact, one of the things he's also going to have, he's going to have this false prophet that hangs out with him. And this false prophet will be able to do signs and wonders. And while he's doing signs and wonders, he's going to point to everybody and say, hey, this guy right here, he's the greatest leader in the history of man. Everybody follow him. It'll be a validation. People will start to worship this guy because he seems to be so brilliant and so advanced in his leadership techniques. In fact, he'll install a one world government. He'll install a one world economy. He'll install a one world religion. As a part of all of this, if you are to buy or to sell according to Scripture, you will have to go get a mark on your forehand and on your forehead. Uh, the Bible says it will be associated with the number 666. Now, 
Most scholars would agree that it's likely not going to be the actual 666. Six is the number of man. It's probably going to be three identification numbers, possibly one for the economy, one for religion, and one for the government. Only God knows. At the bottom line, you will have to have some type of an identifying mark that allows you to buy and sell. And this, this leader at the forefront is going to install all of this. And you're like, well, how does this guy get this kind of power? How, I mean, I get the false prophet thing endorsing him, but like, how does one guy get to control the whole world? Well, I get that Satan's behind him, but how? Ezekiel 38 and 39 gives us some clarity, okay? The greatest battle that's ever going to happen in history will be the battle of Armageddon. That's the one and done. It's over after the battle of Armageddon. That's at the end of the book of Revelation. There's a battle before that one. It's the battle of Gog and Magog. Weird names. God chose that for his, his own purposes. Gog is a man. Magog is a land. And when you study the battle of Og and Magog, you discover that they're going to convene upon Israel. Involved in that will be the land of Rosh, which will be the northernmost boundary from Israel. It's Russia, most likely. It says that they will be led by a leader that is bloodthirsty and wants to take over the whole world. And he'll invade. And he'll do so because he will know that he is backed by the king of the east, which is the furthest east neighbor of Israel, probably China. And he'll get bold because he's got this alliance and he sees these happenings in Israel and he, he comes and the Bible says that the road he will use is the Euphrates River. And the reason he'll use the Euphrates River as a road is because it will be dried up. Did you know that right now the Euphrates River is dry? Now I have no idea if these things are pointing us towards us soon coming in, but I can tell you they are birth pains. And they are significant contractions that are happening in the earth to point to the coming of the Son of God. And what's going to happen is when this battle with, with Russia and, and there will be an Islamic federation probably that will come up out of Africa that will also be involved in this war. One of the reasons that the Antichrist will be able to, raise, to rise to power is because he's also going to show up and he is going to show up and establish such dominion and be able to call for such peace that he will, he will get much of the world to come into alignment with him. That's how he installs the world government, the economy and the one world religion is at that battle. He comes out of that battle with a new level of prestige and a new level of respect and people wanting to bow and worship him and follow him because he cries, peace, peace, and people actually listen to him. One of the things he's going to negotiate is that the temple that was destroyed in Israel, it's going to be rebuilt. And he's going to be able to negotiate that, something people haven't been able to do for thousands of years. And the Bible says he'll rebuild it in three and a half years. At that dedication ceremony, he's going to stand up and proclaim to be the Messiah. And only then do many of the Jews wake up and realize they've fallen for a false Messiah. It's birth pains. Now, I hope you and I don't have to be here for any of that stuff I just described. I hope that we don't have to experience any of the tribulation. I hope that it's like when God come to get Noah before he floods the earth. He says, I'm going to get the righteous out of here. Before he got ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, I'm going to get Lot out of here. I pray that's what you and I get to experience. But at the very least, there are birth pains happening. And I don't know when or how or what the, all of the timeline will look like, but I can promise you this. Revelation chapter 19 introduces us to a new version of Jesus. And when you're in the Gospels, you see a Jesus that's got nails in his hands and nails in his feet and a crown of thorns on his head, and he's being led like a lamb to the slaughter. But on the third day, he got up. And the Bible says he ascended to the right hand of the Father. 
And some of us don't know what he looks like now, so let me help you for a minute. Revelation 19 says he's sitting on a throne, and he sits there with his eyes like fire, and proceeding out of his mouth is a sharp two-edged sword. And there's a vesture dipped in blood that's upon his back, and he goes by the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he's got feet that are shod with brass, and there's going to come a moment when he's going to step onto a white steed. And as he throws his leg over the saddle, he's going to call for 10,000 upon 10,000 angels to mount up and join him. And they're going to come towards earth, and when they come, he's going to matter if it's Gog or Magog or the Antichrist or Satan himself, that great dragon, he will flex the muscles of heaven and he will bring once and for all the rule of heaven to earth and you and I get to read the back of the book and because we are blood bolts, testify that we know who wins. Can I just have somebody somewhere give him praise because you've read the back of the book. Don't panic, just live ready. Come on, slap somebody a high five and tell them, don't panic, just live ready. And so they're going to play some music. I'll land with this. I know some of you got questions. I still got questions. I'm trying to teach this thing, and I still have questions. Here's what I would say to you. Don't be paralyzed by your questions. I heard a guy say this, and I want to share it with you. It's, it's, it's really good. He said, what people need to realize is that the Bible stands above all other sacred writings because unlike any other religious writing, it is over 25% prophecy. And to date, over 80% of those prophecies have been fulfilled in great detail. The Bible itself is provable in many ways. Manuscripts, archaeological discoveries, historical documentation. But we still have questions. What do you do with those questions? Well, if you have questions, go ahead and get right with God and wrestle with them as a Christian. Don't risk your soul. Because here's what the book of James tells us. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally. And the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So you and I can come to God with reverential awe and receive an impartation of wisdom, but don't try to figure all this out separate from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now is the moment and the time to be awestruck first by the cross and what Jesus did for us. Secondly, by the resurrection and his power and his dominion over death, hell, and the grave. But third, to be awestruck by the throne. In that moment when we will finally stand before a glorified Jesus and give account for all of our life. You cannot afford to heap unto yourself people who are going to tell you what you want to hear. You can't afford to play games with deception and live in the gray areas and be casual with God in your Christianity. The earth is experiencing birth pains. And whether this even happens in our lifetime or not, we are closer today than we were yesterday. And whether you do it by God taking his people away or you do it by death, at some point you will stand before the throne of God. And in that moment, it's going to be important that reverential awe precedes the judgment of your eternity. And so if you want to be on the right path, it starts with reverential awe for God. And if you want your prayers to be answered, it starts with reverential awe for God. And according to Scripture, if you want stability in life, it starts with reverential awe for God. And some of you, you've been looking for satisfaction everywhere. If you want it, we learned today, it starts with reverential awe for God. So I'll leave you with this this morning. Revelation 14. And then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, to every tribe, to every tongue, every people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. Can we just read that highlighted portion out loud together? Ready, begin. Fear God and give glory to him. That's what the angels of heaven are trying to communicate to humanity. 
fear God, I give glory to him.